start the recording. OK, all set, Chair Watson. Thank you so much, Brian. I'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. It is 1.02. Um, and we'll go ahead and start with public comments. If there's anyone from the public who would like to make any statements or comments, this is the time. All right, hearing none, uh, we'll go ahead and move on to uh, review and approve the minutes from the March 20th meeting. Would you like to entertain a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Great. John Can Thanks, John. Can we get a second? I'll second. It's Vicki. Hey, Excellent. Brenda. Hi, Vicki. How are you? All right, um, we'll go ahead and uh, I always draw a blank here. All those in favor? Aye. The motion? Aye. All right, uh, motion carries. Um, actually, I can cut me down as a vote. All right, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is to uh, provide an update on the legislative session, and that will be uh, Brian. Fernick, not Brian Garcia. Well, good uh, afternoon. Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So Brian Farnan, the general counsel and uh, chief legal officer of the Connecticut Green Bank. For those who I do not know on this call, um, uh, James DeSantis is on too, so he can always chime in at uh, times too as needed. Um, so on the first slide, um, it was a short session, um, but uh, still a lot was done. Had 174 public acts, special acts. Um, two of those uh, uh, public acts were actually vetoed by Governor uh, Lamont. Uh, and as many of you know who are involved in legislative session, um, this often process starts off with hundreds and hundreds of proposed bills that receive a public hearing, um, and then you know, it, that gets whittled down or items get uh, uh, combined with other items to what is eventually passed. Um, we can go to the next slide. All right, and um, this is uh, what I'm using here is uh, the slides that I used um, for the Connecticut Green Bank Board, but I highlighted the things that I thought are of more importance to this uh, this group. So um, Public Act uh, 2431, uh, some of the things that came out of this were there was a uniform capacity tax for solar. This is kind of like take two of the study. Um, we'll see where that goes. Um, other things in here were um, a pure study on tariffs, uh, some things on uh, solar canopies, uh, and then deep uh, to, you know, to include solar siding in its next uh, integrated resource uh, plan, the IRP. Um, other things are Public Act uh, 2438. Um, this is this. this I, I, I kind of I reference this uh, act that was passed really for this fourth bullet. I don't think anyone ever expects this to ever happen. Um, it is my guess that this was, you know, with some of the back and forth going on between the EDCs and Pura. I, I think this might have been a legislative shot across their bow um, to say that Pura could select, you know, um, the third parties to administer Pura programs. Um, uh, I don't expect that ever to happen, uh, but it's worth pointing out that that was passed as part of that legislation. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, here, uh, other things that we should um, talk about are actually probably we can probably skip this slide. Um, we'll go to, we'll really go into the next slide. Um, in this um, public act 24151, this was the big bond bill. Um, you know, out of there's seven, I think, bills that were passed and signed into the law that deal with like property tax matters and other big adders. But this was this was the large omnibus. Um, uh, bonding bill that was passed pretty much at the, at the end of session, but it has a lot of really interesting things that were included in it. Um, you know, it was 10 million for solid waste reduction. This is like a, for expansion of the municipal food scrap diversion. Um, 125 million for loans, grants to retrofit multifamily housing. Um, 25 million heat pump rebates at point of sale. 
uh, and then 10 million for a new climate resiliency revolving loan fund for municipalities. I think uh, Commissioner Deep was even involved in kind of getting that pushed forward. Um, so that was that was a big bill. Um, Public Act 2459. Um, this dealt with the whole issue of PFAS. I think this is always something that kind of is interesting to our groups or even for us as environmentalists. And when you, for those that don't know, like a PFAS is kind of like this big umbrella terminology for like synthetic chemicals that are used for, um, you know, they're resistant to oil, water, heat, um, and they've been around since the 40s, but there's some significant health concerns with those. Um, we can go to the next slide. And I think just as important of what did pass is what did not pass. And uh, we go to the next slide where it talks about uh, SB 11. Um, you know, this was a large piece of uh, legislation. This was the governor's bill uh, and really his effort on resiliency efforts. Uh, it died on the Senate calendar without taking any action in the Senate or the House. Um, you know, there was a lot of really interesting policies in here. Uh, for example, Section 1 through 10 dealt with um, creating these TIF, TAC, Incremental Financing Districts. Uh, within, you know, that municipalities could set up. Um, I know OPM, uh, one of our board members, Joanna, what was Nick Brown, was very much involved in the drafting that language. Um, there are other things that dealt with, you know, how um, plans of conservation development, they had to include climate change and vulnerability assessments, um, and then uh, other things that dealt with, like, town aid. So, uh, from an environmentalist standpoint, this was this was a tough. Uh, this in the in the it was on the next slide. We talk a little about the Green Monster Bill. We can go to that one too. You know, those were kind of the big, big pieces of legislation um, that that did not pass. And I, I put the little. I forget the name of uh, the the uh, the mascot. I should know that. I'm a Red Sox fan. I, I forget what it is. Um, but HB five. Uh, 5004, you know, this was the what was deemed kind of the, the green monster bill. Um, you know, this was that multi section bill that promoted that was promoted as kind of an incentive based approach to offset the impacts of climate change. Uh, a lot of a lot of important things were included in there. Um, it did get pushed back. There was concern about increasing electrical rates um, that were going to, you know, that would basically uh, how they would be funding to get to meet some of these uh, gas emission goals. Um, that was a uh, uh, both SB 11 and this bill not passing um, was, um, you know, there was a, a lot of disappointment, I think, from the environmental uh, advocates. Uh, next slide. All right, so, but let's, who knows, you know, there was talk about during the summer, during the summer session uh, of bringing back some of these legislation uh, that did not occur uh, for a myriad of reasons. Uh, in essence, you know, when you do bring in a, a you know, summer se session in particular to do certain specific things, and then once you open that door to other things, then everyone can come in. So I think there was some concern there. Um, there is some possibility that there will be a lame duck session uh, this November to kind of address SB 11, to address the green monster, and um, so, you know, that's to be determined. Um, so, so those, those are some of the major big outstanding issues um, that are likely going to come up. Heat pump, solar heat pump deployment plan too. That's another one um, that we think, you know, we're going to see again. And if it's not in a lame, day, a lame duck session uh, this November, um, it's definitely going to be more likely to occur uh, the next legislative session. So remember, in Connecticut, you have two types of legislative sessions. You have a small, uh, you have a short session, and you have a long session. So what we just had was a, was a short session. So it's much harder to get legislation passed uh, during a short session. And the next legislative session, which would be considered a long session, um, you know, major pieces of legislation like SB 11 or the Green Monster are more inclined to pass uh, with that additional time. And, you know, someone once said to me many years ago that, you know, Connecticut is the land of steady habits. So sometimes it takes a few sessions for ideas like uh, those proposed in those legislation uh, to get passed. Um, and they often take maybe one session or two sessions or three sessions of being vetted um, before eventually uh, uh, becoming law. Um, so with that, uh, I would be happy and I'd be happy not to, and I'd be happy to entertain uh, any questions uh, anyone has. I had a question, Brian. Um, I, I don't know whether you know, but there was 25 million um, for uh, heat pumps at the point of sale. So what, uh, how do they, how much, 
how much will people get per heat pump then? I don't know if that's determined yet. Um, I'm assuming yeah. that will be. Oh, I can jump in, Brian. Perfect. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's not determined yet. And, you know, there are some logistical issues with that that we have to work through as well because they didn't approve um, the bill. The bill that is referred to in the statute did not get passed to, oh. for us to develop the plan for implementation. So we're working through right now uh, kind of where that leaves us with that funding. But so but there's nothing in the statute that specifies how much per heat pump. We do have some other funding opportunities related to heat pumps that we can discuss as we work through the uh, funding slides that we're going to talk about, though, John. Oh, well, thank you. Any other questions? If I could just say one more thing, I'll just jump in and say as well on the bond bill that made the change to the revolving loan program to make it a revolving loan and grant program that allows us to use 20 million of the 125 million revolving loan fund uh, for grants. And we are, we are looking at that now. Um, it also allows us to have the revolving loan fund implemented by a quasi public agency, not before we were limited to nonprofit. So just wanted to call this out. Well, Vicki, we're always ready and willing. And whenever you need us, let us know. Yeah, I don't know if I know of a quasi-public that could be helpful there, but <laughs> but definitely something. We'll be having some public process around that. So stay tuned for more there. Cool. That's good. Any other questions for Brian or comments? Okay. Um, we're going to move on to the next item on, on the agenda. Thank you, Brian. And I'll now turn it over to Brian Garcia. All right. Um, all right. So, so why don't I just start off with just an acknowledgement? Um, you know, for those of us who have been on the joint committee, um, when Brenda Watson took over as chair uh, for Eric Brown, uh, what's that been, Brenda? Uh, maybe two years, maybe somewhere around there when Eric retired. Um, your big issue has always been healthy housing. Um, so. Just want to acknowledge that, and I think the conversation today really is going to focus in on that. Um, what we're going to show here is a lot of work that's been done since December, and uh, I'm going to ask my colleagues um, uh, at the uh, utilities, uh, DEEP, as well as the EEB consultants and the Green Bank team to weigh in uh, as we work through uh, these slides. Um, and then we're going to get to at the tail end um, a proposed goal that this joint committee would recommend on up to the respective boards of, you know, the Energy Efficiency Board and the board of the Connecticut Green Bank around uh, a multifamily affordable housing as well as affordable rentals uh, recommendation. Um, okay, so let's let's dig in. So so how did this begin? Um, so in December of last year. Um, Richard, who I see on the line here, uh, the EEB consultants asked uh, the EDCs and the Green Bank uh, to take a look at uh, solar uh, and heat pumps. I think at the time, help me out, Richard, I think the thought was that there were some interesting incentive programs around solar that might be able to, in tandem, uh, encourage uh, both of them to be deployed, uh, but also looking at other opportunities uh, for you know, deployment such as things like storage as well uh, within the context of the residential market. So at one of these meetings in December, uh, Richard proposed that let's get together and see what we can figure out in terms of working together to advance these technologies. Um, we then got together in January. Uh, it was quite fun. We we dug into the state and federal incentives, which we're going to show you uh, and walk through um, in a bit here around uh, solar heat pumps storage and more uh, because we identified other technologies that we want to encourage uh, we then regrouped again in march to double check what we had found uh, to see if there are any additional findings any questions um, and then we regrouped i think we had a a meeting on march 20th uh, that was our our joint committee meeting where we presented where we were and then we got more guidance and direction there to uh, coordinate with DEEP and to dig into looking at the sp specific market segment focuses that we're going to talk about today uh, around uh, affordable 
uh, multifamily affordable housing and affordable rentals. Uh, what types of outcomes we are seeking to try to deliver by deploying uh, the, those technologies, um, things like reducing energy burden, uh, increasing climate resilience, reducing GHGs, uh, the various technologies being considered. We'll talk about those, um, but also thinking about not only the role of state uh, incentives, but also federal incentives and funding too. Uh, along with some of that federal stuff comes federal requirements. So we'll walk through some of that uh, and then we're going to try to get to a goal at the end for consideration of this joint committee. And feel free to raise your hand, any folks on the team. I'll monitor it and uh, you can jump in as well. Um, so we took a look at the technologies here and we started off with solar PV and heat pumps. Uh, and then we had a conversation around battery storage. We're going to get into the details of the different incentives uh, for those programs in a second. Uh, but in our May meeting, it was clear that we needed to include other uh, measures alongside what we were trying to do here. Things like weatherization, um, appliances, uh, you know, electric uh, appliances, um, as well as other uh, types of measures and controls, uh, distributed uh, resources, EV charging, and the like. So we flagged some of the other measures that we want to see. Uh, be deployed in this segment of the market. Um, all right, so let's just jump in. We'll, we'll, we won't go into all the details of the slides, but I think uh, you should all feel that the group has done a pretty comprehensive look at the different incentives that we're going to be talking about. For example, here in Connecticut, we have a great residential renewable energy solutions program. That includes both a buy all, sell all tariff option as well as uh, a behind the meter option. Uh, specifically, there's an option to support um, the deployment of uh, uh, renewable energy technologies for multifamily affordable housing. Uh, I think it was through Section 2 of Public Act 2148 that allowed a deep DOH, CHAFA, the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority, uh, the Green Bank to work with um, Pura in setting the definition for how multifamily affordable housing could be treated as a residential customer. Uh, one would think that that is pretty straightforward, but historically our practice has been to treat uh, multifamily as commercial. Um, so uh, when the, that act passed and all the agency teams did a lot of incredible hard work, uh, Pura then uh, folded in a multifamily affordable housing into this structure where the buy all tariff could be applied. And currently that tariff is set at about 32 cents. So for every kilowatt hour that's generated uh, over a 20 year period, you will get about 32 cents uh, with an adder of five and a half cents if you're deemed affordable housing. So affordable housing uh, deployments of solar could receive uh, greater than 37 cents per kilowatt hour for a 20 year period. Obviously, that's a really big number, really important when you're talking about a levelized cost of energy of solar, you know, in the area of 15 cents, uh, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, depending on inflation. Uh, then you've got all the federal incentives that everyone's super excited about. The investment tax credit, obviously, we've got an extension here through 2032, so a 10-year runway through the Inflation Reduction Act of 30%. Um, there are also a few adders for third-party owned systems for energy communities, so our uh, metropolitan st statistical areas of uh, Fairfield County and New Haven County. Uh, Wyndham actually uh, is no longer in there, but Fairfield and New Haven. Uh, if you are uh, within that municipal, that MSA, you can receive a 10% energy community credit. There are other ways of receiving the credit if you're located within uh, or an adjacent census tract to a former coal-fired power plant or located on a brownfield. So we've all been doing mapping. We know where these properties are. Um, you can receive 10 to 20% uh, more on top of that for low-income communities tax credit. There is 1.8 gigawatts a year for projects that are less than five megawatts of solar um, that can have access to this additional adder. Uh, and then there is a domestic content adder of 10%, but uh, the US is still building out its manufacturing capability in terms of 
uh, a solar PV. So the ITC can be anywhere between 30 to 60% for third-party owned solar PV plus storage systems. That's a huge number, right? That's just super big. And you know, our focus is to enable all of that investment given the public policies in Connecticut to the most vulnerable. Uh, then we've got the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund uh, and other aspects of IRA, uh, which um, we'll, we'll, we'll leave to uh, deep to talk about. Um, with regards to the Solar for All, uh, Project Sunbridge, uh, Deep had submitted a great proposal. Uh, the state won $62.5 million to support Project Sunbridge, uh, which is really focused in on our low-income and disadvantaged communities here uh, with the primary focus around multifamily affordable housing. So trying to take the state policy on affordable housing and use the federal resources to go deeper. Um, uh, and those resources can be used for solar, um, as well as other additional incentives, associated storage and related upgrades, roof repairs, preparing homes by addressing health and safety issues and the like. All right, I'm not going to go into all that much detail like I did on that first slide, but here's battery storage, very similar. Uh, we, the Connecticut Green Bank, along with our electric distribution company colleagues, co-administer energy storage solutions. So uh, these multifamily affordable housing properties uh, receive upfront incentives to reduce the upfront costs and then receive ongoing performance-based incentives for up to 10 years. Um, so those are pretty significant incentives um, for specifically the passive and active dispatch of those batteries. So not only are those batteries intended to provide resilience to the participant, the homeowner or the, the tenant in affordable housing, but also be able to dispatch those batteries to reduce peak demand in summer and winter periods and get compensated for it. Uh, and then we've got all those same federal incentives uh, that can go on top of that as well. All right, so I think I'm gonna turn it here to my EDC colleagues, uh, Natalia Iran. You wanna take it from here? I will take it from here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Natalia Sadika. I am the Energy Efficiency Supervisor at Eversource, and I head up our multifamily initiative. Um, I'll be actually covering information on our multifamily and single family incentive structures, um, and they are implemented jointly by Eversource and Avangrid. So for multifamily properties, I'll start there. Um, they're comprised of five or more units and incentives are offered for whole building solutions. So we're looking at dwelling units as well as common areas. To qualify, 66% of the dwelling units must meet the 60% state medium income. Otherwise, incentives will follow the market rate structure. And on each one of the slides I'll go through, we'll have, we'll have both of those presented. So starting with the prescriptive heat pump incentives, within the common areas, uh, we have $1,500 per ton for air source heat pumps, $2,100 per ton for VRF systems, and $4,000 per ton for ground source heat pumps. And that is really in alignment with our commercial and industrial um, incentives as well. For the any existing heat pumps to new air source heat pumps, right? So it's a, essentially a mini split equipment upgrade. Um, the incentive is $250 per ton. And for any PTAC to PTHPs or package terminal heat pumps, the incentives are $500 per unit um, when, when it is um, a, essentially a market rate project or $750 per unit when it is an income eligible project. And then an important distinction here, um, this table here, we're actually showing um, what the fuel displacement would be for, uh, for electric resistance, oil and propane and natural gas, and then what the prescriptive incentive would be for each one of those. Um, so I, I won't, I won't go through and read every one of them, but essentially, you know, that first, that first row is when it's greater than 60% state medium income. Again, that's following the market rate approach. And then um, the bottom line there, it, there is um, the incentive structure for our uh, income eligible properties. And so 
there's there's two in, the two important notes as well I just wanted to make. So a partial displacement of electric resistance system must include integrated controls, and that's something that we've we've had um, part of our programs for a while on the uh, on the multifamily side. And for heat um, for heat pumps and integrated controls, um, the installers who are actually doing the work must be part of the H pin network and the equipment that's getting installed must be listed on our qualified products list. So next slide, please. And that's the for single family. So um, one thing I wanted to point out here as well is for single family homes, uh, proof of income is required to qualify for the 60% 60, 60 state medium income. Otherwise, incentives will follow the market rate um, or HES, um, similarly to, to what we discussed on the multifamily side. And then for two through four family homes, uh, at least 50% of the tenants must qualify uh, for the state medium income. Um, and it, they are being asked to submit proof of income. So the incentives here, um, again, first line, uh, when it's greater than 60% state medium income, we have $750 per ton for air source heat pumps, and there is a cap of up to $15,000. And on the ground source uh, ground source heat pump side, it's uh, $1,500 per ton, and again, it's up to $15,000 per single family home. When it is a two to four uh, multifamily uh, home, the the cap of 15,000 would essentially be per unit at that point. And then um, when when properties are less than or equal to 60% state medium income on the single family side, it's up to $25,000. Um, and uh, for two to four, it's uh, up to $15,000. $15, there is um, a couple of notes that are important to, to note. So there is a bonus that's being offered and that and the available offer is $500 per home. And that's when customers are pursuing heat pumps um, in addition to insulation as well. And uh, if an existing boiler or furnace will be left in place, um, a qualified integrated control must be installed for heating zones um, where propane oil or natural gas will remain in use. Um, so that's that's a little bit um, aligned with with multifamily there. Um, and the installer must be part of HPEN and then the equipment must be listed on the QPL. So that goes across the board. Um, those are the program requirements. Great, thank you, Natalia. We're, we're gonna come back to you uh, in okay. a second, Natalia. Um, the DEEP team provided uh, this morning an overview of the heat pump incentives. And let me uh, turn it back to Vicki uh, to provide an overview here of the federal incentives. Great, so um, for the IRA home efficiency uh, rebates program and the home electrification and appliance rebates program, these actually go way beyond heat pumps to include multiple measures. Um, we're uh, using all of the electrification measures. We're adopting all of the electrification measures that are allowed by the EPA, as well as weatherization and wiring upgrades. So um, this funding covers heat pumps, it covers weatherization, it covers air sealing, it covers wiring upgrades, uh, some appliances. Um, so I just wanted to be clear that it goes beyond heat pumps. We last Friday, just a, one business day ago, submitted our application for the home electrification and appliance rebates program, which is really exciting. And the next phase is to do um, a blueprint process. We anticipate submitting our application for the uh, home efficiency rebates program next month. Um, so we're moving relatively quickly. You can all expect to hear from us on the process as we roll it out for uh, the for the next phase of planning, which is the blueprint planning. Um, we did in uh, for for the here program, the proposal included all funding being allocated to low income households with a 50 50 split between single family and two plus unit building types. Um, and again, all technologies that were allowed by DOE were included. And um, I also wanted to include here a discussion of the CPRG, which we, was just announced uh, half an hour ago, 
um, at the at a press conference. So the climate pollution reduction grant announcements were made um, just today, and Deep was awarded um, uh, working with five other five states total uh, in New England. We our coalition was awarded 68 million for heat pump midstream incentives as well as additional funding, we think our total share among the states should be somewhere around maybe 100 million. Um, and, and the other initiatives will do things such across uh, the, the participating states, such as workforce development and making sure we're, uh, we're adopting, we're evaluating different types of households like multifamily and mobile homes, for example and also uh, outreach to ensure that uh, we're being inclusive and equitable in our, um, in our uh, uh, implementation of the program. So we're super, super excited. This was a, uh, a competitive grant. We also got uh, uh, awarded a competitive grant in a multi-state coalition for uh, EV charging along, I believe it was I-95. And the uh, city of New Haven also got funding for, I think it was network geothermal. So really exciting things going on in funding from the federal government at the moment. I also wanted to mention here that the revolving loan fund will, that is 125 million and that is not a federal incentive, it's a state incentive. And that is th through bonding, um, will cover pretty much all the things that we've just discussed. That revolving loan fund can be used. Uh, I, I helped draft that language and it and it's very wide ranging and it can be used for multitude of purposes, including a couple things that we have not had funding for that I think we really need. And those include um, navigation programs for people, because as you can see, <laughs> we have a, there are many sources of funding and it can be difficult to navigate among them. And so we are uh, exploring how best to provide services, especially for people with fewer resources or for landlords that wanna adopt comprehensive um, approaches. We're exploring how to provide those navigation services in partnership perhaps with co local community groups and, and, so, and municipalities. And also it can be used for health and safety barrier remediation, which I know is an issue near and dear to many of our hearts. And we have our REPS program, which is successfully tackling uh, this issue at a small scale for now. And we would like to expand the um, per home cap and be able to do more with that in coordination with the Solar for All funding that allows us to, um, to, use, to use some of that funding for roof upgrades. So really exciting things going on. That's really great, Vicki. I'm so excited for the state of Connecticut and the people that are gonna benefit. Thank you to Deep for all of your hard work. What What's the interest rate on the uh, revolving loan fund? Well, we haven't designed it yet. Okay. Uh, so it's on our, it's in our, it's in our work plan to roll out a public process probably this fall to start designing that. It, it's supposed, it, it, it can't begin before next July. So we're hoping to get it, you know, to a point by then of nearly being ready to roll out. And, and did I hear you say that Connecticut's share would be a total of 168 million? So 68 for one program and 100 for the other? Did I hear that correctly? Um, well, we have the home and he, the here and her program. Sorry, uh, we should be getting about a hundred million for those. For we are getting about a hundred million for those, just under. And for uh, the CPRG program, that's sixty-eight million for heat pump uh, incentives midstream. But we're also going to get a share of the. Uh, funding that is that we're using implementing in coordination with other states on joint work around uh, workforce development and things of that nature. And so we think the total that we'll be getting from the EPA for that program will be somewhere around a hundred million dollars. But that's you know the, the we know how much we're getting for the heat pump rebates. We're not a hundred percent certain how it will work out for the remaining money that remains to be worked out. Awesome. And um, maybe Brian, you can answer this, Brian Garcia. What 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 is the estimated workforce gap in Ooh. the clean energy industry? <laughs> uh, like how, many, how many people Just do we need? Just a small question. To, to hire? Um, yeah, no, no, it's a good question. I, I think um, 
I, I may, let me answer it this way. Given the, the ambitious goals that the state has established in terms of the public policy targets that we want to achieve, we need more investment in workforce development to, to achieve them. Uh, let me leave it there. That's probably the extent of my expertise on the issue. <laughs> Unless, Vicki, you want to say or, or I'll add something. I, I know, you know, we're working closely with the Office of Workforce Strategy and DECD. Um, uh, so, yes, yes, we we don't have a number as, as, as to, we don't have numbers for all of that yet, Brenda, but we are working on, um, on getting there. But okay. certainly a lot of our federal funding that's coming in has a workforce aspect to it. That's excellent. You know, I know that uh, the session might feel like we didn't get a lot done, but this is definitely in contrast well, to the feeling. We definitely got one of the things that uh, we interested in the on the building side pushed very hard for, which was getting some of that revolving loan converted to a grant. I consider that a, a big success because that's mm -hmm. 20 million of funding for things that we cannot use funding in CNLM for because they wouldn't necessarily be considered cost effective under the requirements of CNLM. And that's the health and safety barriers and uh, navigation services. So I'm super excited about uh, that and very, very grateful to the legislature and the governor for, for that. Here, here, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, are, are there any other questions for, or, or Brian, are we going back to yeah, we're going to keep going. This is, uh, yeah, keep keep the questions coming. What we wanted to present was just, as you're seeing, all the specificity around the incentive and financing programs for state and federal uh, resources, and it's building, right? So uh, let's let's just keep going, if that's okay, Chair Watson. We'll go to Nicole. I'll, try, I'll chime in with one more thing, too. We are currently working on um, a contracting process, an RFP and contracting process, to develop an incentive tool that will allow people and developers to plug in information and find out which of these myriad programs they may be eligible for based on their income or where they live, because some are focused on certain income levels. Some are focused on EJ communities, for example, like the grant and the revolving uh, loan and grant program is focused on EJ communities uh, or alliance districts, I think. So, um, so we're working on a tool. It'll probably take a while to get it done, but we are working on something that will help people to, uh, you know, have everything in one place as far as what's available to them. Awesome. Super needed. All right, Natalia, are you ready? Let's pick it back I'm up. I'm ready. Please. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so next very important topic is weatherization. And, you know, that really goes hand in hand with, um, with heat pump installation as we encourage customers to address weatherization. Um, so on the multifamily side, we'll start there first. The incentive for dwelling unit direct install air sealing is $200 per hour for units that are 800 square feet um, or, or smaller, um, not to exceed one hour of air sealing. And then for those units that are a little bit larger than that, uh, we do have a cap of um, air sealing not to exceed two hours. And the incentives for custom measures, and I'll, I'll list those out, those include a duct sealing, insulation, whether it's in the attic, the basements, or the exterior walls, um, as well as any, you know, any windows, uh, window replacements. Those are subject to the incentive caps below in, in, in this table. And again, going back to um, a couple slides ago where I clarified the market rate um, and the income eligible uh, difference and incentives. Um, for the purpose of this conversation, let's look at the bottom line, which is less than or equal to 60% state medium income. For comprehensive projects, the incentives are up to 90% of project cost. Um, a comprehensive project is really when when folks have uh, two or more end uses that they're addressing. So maybe uh, coming in, a, uh, maybe lighting and um, HVAC uh, going on at the same time. Um, that that would yield a, a bit of a higher incentive. Uh, for single end uses, though, if it's just one uh, one measure being addressed, the incentive is up to seventy five percent of the measure cost. And then for direct install measures, it's up to 100% of the installed cost. So that's for multifamily. On the single family, uh, one through four, 
Um, if the HES and HES IE technician will provide rebate information based on their recommendations for the home. And so rebates might look like uh, the following in the table. And again, we're looking at, you know, maybe the bottom bottom uh, line there uh, for less than less than or equal to 60% state me medium income. That's for the HES IE program. Um, for insula insulation, incentives are up to 100% um of the approved insulation project and the installing contractor needs to be part of the CTIN network and on the window side um, it really varies with the HES IE comprehensive incentive um, and that's when folks are replacing their single pane single pane with storm or double pane windows to triple pane um, and what we mean by this uh, sort of variation is, um, you know, currently we cover 100%, but measures um, maybe such as, you know, HVAC or, or in this in this case, windows, they might have a copay to the customer. And so we do have a comprehensive incentive potential um, and we utilize the IQT tool to, to come up with the, um, the comprehensive incentive that would be applied. And we have appliances next on the multifamily side. Uh, so for refrigerators, um, we do ask that the existing units uh, electric consumption um, is uh, five, at least 550 kWh uh, or higher. Um, and then that the new units are Energy Star rated to qualify for program incentive caps, and the caps follow uh, the previous multifamily slide. Uh, for heat pump water heaters, we are going back to the prescriptive approach as we, as we have uh, implemented for all of our heat pump uh, measures this year. Um, the equipment must be Energy Star rated to qualify for a prescriptive incentive, which is uh, $800 per unit when it is um, on the income eligible side side and then um, 60, $650 per unit when it falls within the market rate side. And then on the single family side, again, the HES and HES IE participation um, is required to be eligible for <laughs> primary and freezer incentives. Um, the heat pump, water heaters, and appliances must be Energy Star certified. Um, so you know that's that's across the board there. Um, and then for less than less than or equal to sixty percent state medium income, for primary re refrigerators, the the incentive is five hundred dollars. For primary freezers, it's two hundred dollars. And then for heat pump water heaters, again, it varies with that HSIE comprehensive incentive. Excellent. Thank you, Natalia. I think that wraps that up. Um, let me just put one more flag here uh, for us on the federal tax credits. I think, uh, Brian, let's double check this and we can close this off with, with the crew here. I think it's 25C is the residential energy efficiency tax credit. Um, I don't want to presume that multifamily affordable housing tenants or affordable rentals don't have access to that, but uh, up to $1,200 per year, the lesser of up to $1,200 per year or 30% of the total installed cost of a project or up to $2,000 for heat pumps uh, is available every year through 2032. So uh, uh, tax credit money on the table if uh, there is tax credit uh, eligibility there. We tried to take a look at the transferability of that tax credit and it's not transferable. So um, if it was, we could, we could bring it in. Um, but uh, let's go to financing here and I'm gonna ask uh, Mackie Dykes to uh, lead us through this uh, solar and storage. Great, thanks, Brian. <laughs> and so we have actually two products uh, that are focused on the affordable multifamily sector. Um, the first is our solar and storage lease. Uh, this is the one that we're seeing the most traction with uh, currently in the market. Um, I think there's a lot of yeah, a lot of attractive features for it. Um, the first or generally the, the way it's structured is that the green bank owns the solar and if, if they pair, pair it with uh, battery uh, on the battery as well. 
Um, so since we're the owner, uh, we front all the capital for the system. Um, we are responsible for all the operations and maintenance costs and responsibilities throughout the term <laughs> of the lease, which is 20 years. Um, so then the way that sort of the, the, the value proposition then to the property owner is you know, they get these assets um, uh, installed on their property for no cost. Uh, and they would receive a portion of the credits from the RS tariff. Um, the tenants would also receive a portion of those in the case of a tenant metered property. Uh, and for a master metered property, the tenant portion would be used to fund an improvement to the property. Um, and so, yeah, so it's, you know, it's, it's quite attractive, um, essentially unlocking solar and the, the revenue from the project uh, for no cost. Uh, the green banks monetizing all the tax credits and everything and, and handling all that. Uh, if it's if it's paired with battery, then the green bank takes the, oh. the battery incentives and then is able to provide resiliency to the property. Um, and then we also have a loan option as well if the property owner prefers to, to own the, the assets themselves. Thanks, Mac. Anything, Vicky, you want to reinforce here? Forgive me, I have that revolving loan fund slide here. Sorry, what was that, Brian? Uh, I was, I was, I had put that revolving loan fund slide after. Ah, slide okay, now. I already covered it. <laughs> Sorry, I jumped out of order. No, no. All right, let's keep going. Um, all right, so um, the other thing that we have to think about when we're using federal funds and uh, Brian, I think uh, I'm going to flag this for us to do as well with uh, I think probably deep is to look at all the different federal requirements for the different programs that are going to be required. So Davis Bacon being one of them, uh, which was, you know, an act uh, enacted uh, in the 1930s to protect communities and workers. Um, and this has to do with prevailing wages. So projects supported by Solar for All, uh, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, Solar for All, National Clean Investment Fund, and the like, uh, uh, Davis-Bacon is required there. But I think we're going to have to do a little map probably on the federal uh, incentives that are coming into the state as Vicki has laid out um, and see what uh, the different requirements are just so we're all knowledgeable uh, about that. This is just a, a point to, to reinforce that. There's also Build America, Buy America provisions, uh, National Historic Preservation, uh, Disadvantaged Business Enterprises, a number of different things here that are really trying to do a couple things. One, lift up workers in the economy. Uh, to your question earlier about workforce development, Brenda, as well as ensuring that there's investment happening in our vulnerable communities, our Justice 40 uh, communities. So. Uh, lots of those requirements come with the federal dollars, uh, which is good. Okay. Um, all right. So, so any anything there before we kind of move to the goal section? So, as you can see, the the teams have done a really comprehensive look at all the different incentives and financing programs for state and federal programs. Um, that was a lot of the heavy lift that we worked through in the first quarter and a little bit of the second quarter this year. This is really quite remarkable. Um, I don't think that people are aware that, you know, community development in uh, communities that have a high concentration of poverty through the lens of energy and environmental justice can really uplift communities and um, reduce energy burdens and improve air quality. That's just not only in line with the state's climate change goals, but just a way to work as an anti-poverty mechanism. So I'm really proud that we have reached this point I, at this point, would like to now entertain a motion. Um, and oh, are we still talking other issues? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe just real quickly. Um, so, yeah. so uh, two two minutes. One, um, the joint committee has an existing principle that we're operating under. Um, the Energy Efficiency Board and the Green Bank have a shared goal to implement state energy policy throughout all sectors and populations of Connecticut with continuous innovation towards greater leveraging of ratepayer funds and a uniformly positive customer experience. So I think we've been talking a lot about that, like in this half hour. Um, and then just real quickly in terms of the state energy policy, this is probably not even all of 
the things on the list from greenhouse gas emission reduction targets to uh, you know zero emission um, behind the meter targets to weatherization you know to vulnerable community investments you, you, know, you name it this is what really excites I think a lot of us is having a foundation of public policy uh, that really directs us and guides us in terms of the goals that we're seeking to target. Uh, so those are also foundational here as well. Uh, but I think where, yeah, why, why don't I turn it to you here, Brenda, on this one? <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and read this off, or are we going <laughs> to move on? With, okay, so uh, our proposed goal here is to enable greater investment in and deployment of technologies and affordable rental single and multifamily properties to realize important benefits for tenants. Um, reducing energy burden um, in which we would increase climate resilience uh, through the conservation and load management plan of the Energy Efficiency Board and comprehensive plan of the Connecticut Green Bank Board of Directors and through greater coordination of incentive and financing programs from state and federal sources of capital. So I would like to now <laughs> introduce um, a um, actually move to advance this as a, a motion resolution the resolution so, would be motion for the joint committee to recommend to the energy efficiency board and the green bank board of directors to adopt the proposed goal within their perspective pl respective plans i.e conservation and load management plan and co comprehensive plan respectively I'll move so i'd like to move that motion, motion. Okay, so John and then seconded by Vicki. Sounds good. All right. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstentions or nays? All right. Motion passes. That's awesome. Let, let me just let me just kind of step back for a second and just really acknowledge you know, our EDC partners, deep the EEB consultants for bring, raising this. I feel like this goal really reflects the desires of our respective organizations to ensure that we're driving more investment and deployment in these technologies. And, you know, we're going to realize all these federal incentives um, to unlock more investment that's going to get us there. Our teams still have to work super hard uh, to get from here to there. But I think when we look back in 2032, when, when all of these tax credits and things ends, we're going to knock on woods, have seen hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, definitely billions, I would say billions, we're going to see billions of dollars of investment in our vulnerable communities here as a result. So just a big kudos. Uh, thank you, Chair Chair Watson, for this, getting us to this point. We now have to execute. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you. If I well, may as well. Hey, Sorry, go ahead, Brenda. Well, I was just going to say, when I reflect back on where we were in, um, you know, June of 2020, when we were all not only stressed out and trying to, you know, figure out ways to work and we were addressing energy burden issues and the lack of weatherization in, in poverty, impoverished communities and to get to where we are today, I feel very, very proud of um, serving on this subcommittee and being a part of this movement. Um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to John, if you don't mind, Vicki. Yeah, I, I just wanted to um, say that the the roundtable on climate and jobs is working with Eversource right now to figure out a way. Eversource is uh, retiring their their gas fleet in favor of electric vehicles, and what we want to do is use the uh, the gas fleet uh, as loaner cars for. Uh, people in the training system and people getting their first jobs that don't have transportation. It's a it's a issue that has plagued us for like 25 years now. People have said we can train people, but we then they can't begin work. And so we're trying to bust through that uh, finally and working now with insurance companies on rates and stuff like that. But I think we're going to be able to uh, successfully do this. Thanks, John. Vicki? Yeah, I just want to say this is really exciting. I'm, you know, we've been doing this for a long time, but 
The vision is to break down all the silos between the different programs, between CNLM and the programs that appear overseas, but also now all of the, these federal programs and to really start implementing more comprehensive retrofits and helping customers to uh, to to know and uh, and participate in all of the things that can work together to lower their energy burden and help them participate in a more mo modernized grid and help them increase uh, the air quality inside and outside their homes and improve their health. It's really, really exciting. And many of these programs, I do want to emphasize, are focused on either anywhere from 50% to 100% on um, either people with low income or people who live in environmental justice communities or alliance communities, alliance district communities. Um, we're really uh, very, very focused on providing benefits to those who have not been able to participate in the in the past at, at an equitable uh, pace with other customers. So uh, I think this is really a, a moment in history that things are really coming together. It's very exciting. I agree. I agree. If there's if there's any content that we should share on social, please, you know, send that over to to members so that we, you know, stay on message. And I think it would be a great way if, if everyone kind of started doing that because we want to really promote the hard work that our state agents are doing and our quasi state agents are doing on behalf of everybody in the state. And I, I just don't think that that gets the promotion that it deserves. So, um, all right. Uh, 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 were there any other comments or questions about that item? Any of that? All right. Um, other business? I'm going to turn that over back to Brian Garcia. Um, I don't have any other business. Hey, I, I had one comment. This is John Harrity. Um, that Eric Brown, when he retired, um, uh, in order to help out his community, be he became a school bus driver. And in doing so, he became a member of the Machinist Union. So we're, we're proud to welcome him into our ranks. <laughs> I saw that uh, 60 Minutes segment, John. I thought I was the only one who was a, a nerd like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's all right. Great. Um, all right. Uh, so then we're going to go ahead. Are we moving into public comments, Brian? Yeah, if there's any public comments, and then we'll adjourn. Yep. So, Kathy Fay, I know that you noted something in the comments that you maybe would you like to maybe, for the record, verbally share your comment? I can find, there we go, I couldn't find my unmute button. Um, all I, I wrote in the comments that if I were a voting member of the Joint Committee, I would also have voted yes on those uh, resolutions. Really awesome. excited Thank about you. this new chapter. Same here. Same here. Any other mem uh, comments from the public? All right, well, I would like to move to adjourn this meeting, this very comprehensive and, and important meeting, I think, of, of all the meetings that I've chaired so far. And again, I want to thank uh, the Brian and his team at the Green Bank and the folks at DEEP, um, Energy ICT, and the utilities for really working together to get this done. Thank you all very much. Thank you, everybody. All right, take care, folks. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.